I assume, Babs, you're going to bring up the slides. So yes. we're at 1235 if you want to start us. Hmm. All right. All right. Uh, you ready? Oh, wait. <laughs> All right. Welcome, everybody, to the uh, Clinical Consultation Network. Uh, I am filling in as host today. I'm Michelle Bagby. For those of you who don't know me, uh, the Director of Behavioral Health and Crisis Services for the department. Uh, Dr. Davis is out and he has asked me to host and I am happy to host uh, specifically the, the presentation that we have for you today. Um, I saw Catherine McLaughlin, who's going to be uh, talking with us today at the ARC National Conference in Denver. And I was blown away by the presentation and I was like, Babs, we have to get her on CCN. So I'm very excited that we were able to do that. Uh, she's going to be talking to us today about sex education for people with developmental disabilities um, and, and covering some, some material that I think is so important for all of us to, to have and, and some resources that I also think are amazing <laughs> um, that, that you'll be able to hopefully utilize with the people that you work with. Um, so with that, uh, I want to share some upcoming presentations we have on Clinical Consultation Network. Uh, on the 21st, we have John Quill Newland uh, with the Tennessee Commission on Children and Youth, and our, our very own Trey King is going to be uh, hosting that day in Dr. Davis's presence, uh, in his absence, I guess I should say. Um, on the 28th, we have a National Association for Dual Diagnosis or NAD collaboration that we're going to do our, our fourth Thursday feature or fourth Tuesday feature. Um, I believe Dr. Davis is going to be back hosting for that one. Um, on March 7th, we have uh, our very own behavior analyst within the department, Mickey Tonos, is going to be back. Uh, and then on March 14th, Patrice Coleman with the National Department of Emergency Communications is going to be on. Uh, talking about the rapid SOS program. So that's what we have coming up on the clinical consultation network. Now I'm going to turn it over to our guest, uh, Catherine McLaughlin, to introduce herself. And don't forget to give us a fun fact about yourself in that introduction. Uh, and then we will let you take the stage as far as your presentation goes. We're really excited to hear. Great. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Catherine McLaughlin. I've been a sexuality educator and trainer for, for over uh, 25 years. And what it kind of came about when I, I was working for a family planning agency and um, a lot of people were reaching out to me saying, how do we work with people with intellectual developmental disabilities? And um, I had said, yeah, you know, good, you know, good question. I don't know much about it. And, and so I started to do some research about it. And as I'm sure you can imagine, this was 25 years ago, there wasn't a lot going on in the field of sexuality and people with disabilities. Uh, but things are changing now, which is, which is exciting um, and hopefully will impact some of the, the negative consequences of the lack of education. So also during that time, I experienced an accident and I, started to use a wheelchair. So I think, you know, personally, I was noticing these differences that people were treating me differently, even though I was the same person. And so I started to become more aware of disability as well. So I think those two things together really kind of set a path for me. And um, I've done lots of work with self advocates themselves. So people with intellectual developmental disabilities, and they've been uh, really instrumental in creating materials and uh, Green Mountain Self Advocates worked with me. They're from Vermont um, to write a curriculum. So I would write it and then they'd give me feedback and then they field tested it. So they were trainers and um, there was a professional and a self advocate team of trainers. Um, so that's just a, a little bit about me. I live in New Hampshire. And a fun fact about me is that I love swimming in a lap pool. And my favorite part of it is just going underwater and you can't hear any buzzing or vibrations or, you know, screens aren't underneath the water and there's no noise, you know, so it's like you're in this, you're totally checked out. So it's very relaxing to be underwater and swimming. So that's my fun fact. 
Hopefully it's a heated lap pool if you're in Vermont. <laughs> oh, yes. I'm in New Hampshire, but um, yes, it's a heated lap pool inside. Um, but I did um, tell Michelle earlier that I went this, this January to Mexico with my family and never really done anything like that before. And we went to a resort that had an outdoor lap pool. So 85 degrees and sunny and I'm swimming in a lap pool. That's me. <laughs> All right, so let me start talking about the content. And. All right, so here we are. Oops, there you all moved. I'm just going to put you back on the other screen here. All right. <clears throat> okay, so um, sexuality education for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And um, I also, just to add, I have my own business. It's called Elevatus Training. And we came up with the name because. I'm always trying to elevate the status of others, especially people with disabilities. So elevate us um, is the, the name of the business. And there's three of us working there. So very small, but um, it's I kept getting more and more requests. So I started to focus on this full time and I've I've really enjoyed it. It's been a nice um, culmination of all my work through my careers. Um, so we're going to talk about this and like Michelle said, I was at the um, <clears throat> National Art Conference. So I pulled some pieces from this because there's a uh, less time. Um, <clears throat> but when I was there, I had a self advocate pre presenting with me as well. So I try to bring self advocates to conferences if I can and um, just get them out there and be more of the leaders of of this movement rather than the professionals. Um, so we're going to talk about sexual self-advocacy and sexual health. We're going to explore myths about people with IDD and sexuality. We're going to understand what people with IDD need and want for sexuality and relationship education, and also look at some statistics and talk about the need for sexuality education. So this, um, this first um, slide, are really, it's really about legislation. And <clears throat> the orange states require that people with intellectual developmental disabilities receive some kind of sexuality education. So in Virginia, it's actually, it has to be addressed on their IEPs in the school and the school has to make sure that they provide ed education. Illinois is more, it just actually recently was passed and it's <clears throat> more of a, um, adults with intellectual developmental disabilities. So any providers throughout the state have to offer education to the people that they're supporting. Um, and these other same thing that they require some form of sexuality education. And then the dark blue <clears throat> just said, there's five of those as well, requires that health education is accessible to people with disabilities. Um, so it, depending on what their health education is, People with disabilities get the same type of education, you know, tailored to them, but the same topics. And then these lighter blue ones, there's four of them. They offer some guidelines around this, but no, nothing's re nothing's enforced. Uh, it's not a law. It's not legislation. It's just sort of guidelines. Um, so you can see here, there's a lot of need for sexuality education. And my my dream is that all these states are orange eventually so that it's required because when you have legislation behind you, um, you have to do it, right? And so all the barriers kind of go away because it's a requirement um, that you do this. So um, <clears throat> that's part of it. Um, so I'm curious if people could write in the chat, um, whether you're a self-advocate yourself, a parent or, family member, a professional, a combination, anything along those lines. And I'm just wondering if I can still see the chat. I don't know, and it doesn't look like I can. It's tricky when you're presenting, you have to select those three dots and then uh, more, I believe, and then the chat is within that. Okay. Three dots. It's complicated, but I can read. Too. Okay, yeah, that would be great. What are you seeing? <laughs> that would be a trend. 
Uh, so we've got a lot of professionals. Uh, we've got some parents. Okay. Uh, we have mental health providers. Uh, crisis stabilization services, professional sister. We've got siblings. Uh, we've got advocates. Uh, we've got a professional, a family member, and a self advocate. Uh huh. Right. It's, that seems to have slowed down. Mostly coming in with professional, some family right. members, and a couple self advocates. Great. Um, and then, are you excited about being here? We're definitely getting yeses on that one. <laughs> Myself included, very excited. <laughs> Um, and I guess the other thing is, do you know everything there is to know about sexuality and relationships? A few people laughed. Okay. <laughs> and exactly. Said, no, uh, and absolutely no not. There's no? a few possibilities. <laughs> There's yeah. less, less confidence in that in that in that response for sure. Yeah. Great. Thank you all for that. Yeah, I think um, there's so much to learn and it's also um, <clears throat> changing too. You know, I mean, there's a lot that stays the same around sexuality, but, you know, different language, different genders, you know, all kinds of things are changing. And so I feel like I'm constantly learning about sexuality and relationships and all of that, depending on What's happening in the culture as well. Um, so I think one important piece is we often think of sexuality, we think of sex right away. Um, but there's there's a big difference between the two. So I'm going to share just my definition of sexuality. But in general, my experience is that when you say sexuality, people think sex. And that's a piece of it, but not all of it. And so sometimes you know, healthy relationship class is, you know, more people can, people think, oh, that's great. Who wouldn't want to have healthy relationships? Because um, that's really what it's about. It's not just about sex, because there's so many different types of relationships as well. So to me, sexuality is about intimacy, connection, and belonging. So do you have close relationships with people? Do you feel part of a community, uh, that belonging piece? Um, <clears throat> connection as well. It's also about all different kinds of relationships. So friendships, sexual relationships, family relationships, helping professionals, um, strangers, coworkers, classmates. So it's all different kinds of relationships too. And then how we feel about being the gender that we were assigned when we were born. And, and our gender identity and sexual orientation is a part of our sexuality. Uh, it's how we feel about others in those different kinds of relationships and ourselves, like self-esteem and body image. And um, a lot of self-advocates talk about not having confidence. So how to build confidence around being in different kinds of relationships. And then it's about sexual expression and behavior and the different forms of sexual expression but it's a big part of who we are. And I often say that we are uh, sexual beings from birth to death, but that doesn't mean that you're having sex if you're a sexual being. It means that you have a sexuality and you know, everyone's is different, might have different attraction or gender or um, preferences or, all kind, you know, we're all very, very different. Um, so it's a total of who we are, what we believe, what we feel, and how we respond. So I'm going to talk about, um, you know, why is it important for people with IDD to learn about sexuality and relationships? And this is the, you know, kind of sad part about it all, but um, people with disabilities, I, the ones I worked with in, at Green Mountain Self Advocates, I talk to them about um, why do you want and need to learn about this? So their voices uh, are really loud and clear that they want this kind of education. And just an aside, I'm doing a eight week class with a group of self advocates online in New York, New York State for a grant. And we, we had a cap of 15 and we're up to like 50 that have signed up already. 
So there is a huge need um, and people, I mean, we, the flyer has been out four days or something. So um, <clears throat> we started a waiting list. But some of the things that self-advocates say is, so we can learn to have healthy relationships. So we aren't lonely. And again, there's that intimacy, connection, belonging, not feeling isolated. Uh, so we can make informed choices. Um, so first of all, so we can make choices. And then they're saying, you know, I want informed. I want to be informed so I can make choices. Um, so we can pick the right person for the toughest part of the relationship, making it last. So we can be safe because we all have desires and needs and that's okay. So that people know their rights. So we can become sexual self-advocates, not just self-advocates. And a lot of, um, a lot of the, the, the barriers for people with disabilities and not all, but some parents or some professionals don't feel comfortable. And I'll be talking more about that, but the self-advocates say it's more the reaction that they get from uh, people around them that makes it difficult to speak up for what they need. Um, so I think that's important to know our reactions. You know, we'll say, if they say to someone, I wanna start dating, they kind of like there's silence and discomfort and oh, uh, but if they ask for to get an apartment or get a job or something, people say, oh, great, let's talk about what, yeah, what are you interested in? And um, and that we want to try to think about it that way, like, oh, great, you want to start dating. Tell me more about that um, and be positive about it rather than fear based, which many messages that we all received around that were fear-based messages. And we'll talk about that as well. And then there was a, a few self-advocates in Illinois that say, I wanna learn, I wanna know more so I can decide what is right for me. So that informed choice, my body, my choice. I didn't receive any education in schools or from my provider. I learned by the school of hard knocks. I'm still trying to work through the trauma of learning the hard way. And the last one is we had classes at the group home in the past, but it's been a, a long while. I can't remember what I learned. So really here they're saying, I want information so I can make choices about my life and my body. Um, I don't want to learn by, mis by negative experiences because it's too traumatic. I'd rather know ahead and be able to protect myself. And then I need to hear and learn about this more often as well. So pretty strong messages from people with disabilities. And if you haven't seen abused and betrayed or listened to abused and Re betrayed at national public radio series, and the link is here. Um, and this is one of the, the series and it's about people with intellectual disabilities talk about rape. So it's, it's very um, intense, very powerful around hearing their stories around this. Um, I'm not going to play it now, um, but that is a great resource. Um, but just in general, some of the numbers around sexual abuse. So depending on the study, research shows people with disabilities are anywhere from four to 10 times more likely to experience sexual abuse in their lifetime. And the NPR series, they looked at national crime statistics and they found that people with intellectual developmental disabilities were seven times more likely than the general population. And for women with IDD, 12 times more likely to be sexually abused. Um, so lots of um, shocking, uh, disheartening statistics. And I think another one that's really interesting too is that for victims with disabilities, their rapist is known to them 86% of the time. So with the general population, 72%. Um, and lots of self-advocates are really afraid of strangers. And as soon as I bring it, stranger danger, stranger danger. And I want them to know, yeah, there are some strangers that can hurt you, but many, most will not. And actually people that you know could hurt you. We often think they can't. Um, so just some of these statistics are important messages that we want to give people with disabilities. And I, it's never a person with a disability's fault if they get if they experience sexual abuse. The reason the abuse happens is the abuser abuses. Um, but I think it's also important to look at well, why are people at risk? 
um, because many people say that um, uh, perpetrators think of someone with a disability as the perfect victim. So why are they the perfect victim? And here are just some thoughts. So lack education on healthy relationships and sexuality. So often don't have basic information. Um, and some examples of those are, I was working with someone who was 50 years old, who had um, did not know how babies were made at all. Um, so just general lack of education. Um, people are often think of them as not sexual at all. They don't, they're not interested in any of that which is why they don't get education, or they're thought of as oversexed. And so people try to control that oversexed self and by withholding information. Um, and sometimes people think they can't consent or understand. So this often leads to people being taken out of classes. Self-advocates have told me they're in the mainstream health class learning about physical activity. And then the sexuality unit starts and they're removed from class. Um, so lack basic information and also often lack language, which recently someone told me about um, a woman in a day program that said he keeps touching my purse. So they would take her purse and they put it in you know, a drawer or try to like give her some privacy for her things. And three weeks later, they finally discovered that purse was her, her nickname for her vulva. So had she known these terms, she could have just said, he keeps touching my vulva. Um, then we, we who, and what's, what's happening, you know? Um, so that language piece. And the, another piece with language is sometimes around gender identity and sexual orientation. So there's sort of this belief that pe people can become gay or trans or whatever, that it's, that, um, you know, don't give them the language because then they won't get any ideas. And, you know, people with dis disabilities or not are born with a certain sexual orientation and gender identity. And so um, not knowing the language to sort of figure yourself out, your identity um, can be really hard for people too when they don't know the words because people are, are not giving them the words. Often not thought of as adults, but considered children. And we really wanna think about people, the age that they are. And so what if they're 20 years old, whether they have a disability or not, they need the same information based on biological age. Um, how you teach it would be different based on their cognitive abilities and limitations and things, but not what topics necessarily. Um, so we, and we also wanna treat um, treat, have expectations for them so that they understand kind of the social norms and things. So if we, if we forgive behavior, we're treating them like children. We're treating them like we do, you know, two-year-olds who crawl up on your lap or something thinking that you're their father or mother or, you know, a parent of, or guardian or something. We think, oh, it doesn't matter. They don't, they didn't mean anything. But we really want, because then that sets them up for being potentially victimized if they don't know the rules that we, we have in our culture. So we want to teach those rules as well. So part of sexuality and relationship education is some of those social norms um, and boundaries. So, uh, so unhealthy boundaries, yeah. Oftentimes we protect rep instead of educate. And another thing is that oftentimes people aren't believed when, when you report. So no education that meets their need due to the nature of their disability. So if they're in the mainstream health class, they may not be learning about how do you pick up on uh, body language and things like that, because that's a skill we think everyone has. But maybe based on their disability, they, um, they don't have those skills. So sometimes we have to teach some of those skills as well. And then no so social opportunities or relationships beyond family and staff. So often lack friendships and so uh, social opportunities to practice being in relationship and learning what the social norms are um, and may even miss out on some form informal learning. So maybe you all learned about sexuality and relationships from your friends. And I'm not saying it was always accurate, but you got something out of that. Um, 
And so often miss out on that informal learning and aren't getting it in schools. Um, so often become adults and have no, no education, which is setting them up. Um, so this is, I'm going to show this video to you. Uh, it's just a, it's a resource from the council, National Council on Independent Living Sex Ed Series for people with IDD, and it's created and taught by people with IDD. And this is just the introduction, but it kind of talks about some of the myths and stereotypes that, that are out there for people with disabilities. Sex Ed for people with IDD. Welcome. Why do we have to make a video about sex ed for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities? When the other kids had sex education, I had to go somewhere else. Other kids got to learn about birth control and condoms and how to be parents and all anyone ever told me was don't have sex. My parents had a big discussion about sex with my sister who doesn't have a disability. But when I was growing up, nobody said anything to me. There are a lot of myths of sexuality and people with disabilities. Some people feel people with disabilities aren't sexual and that we don't need sex education at all. But that's not true. People also say people with disabilities are too sexual or hypersexual. If they start talking to us about sex, we're just going to go right out and start having sex all over the place. That's not true either. Other folks think people with IDD don't have the same variety of sexual and gender identity. We do, and we shouldn't ignore that. These myths is how people with disabilities are portrayed in the media. So welcome to our sex ed video for and by people with IDD. It has different parts. You can skip around. You can watch from beginning to end. It's up to you. Produced by the National Council on Independent Living and Rooted in Rights, with support from the WITH Foundation. All right. So that uh, that's just the intro. And then there's, I think, seven or eight topics and they're short videos. So you can use that with self advocates if you're teaching them about sexuality as well. All right. Now. So why is it difficult to discuss, teach, support others on this topic? I'm making an assumption, but I if, just if people want to put in the chat, like, why do you think it is difficult to discuss, teach, or support others, whether it's your own children or uh, a family member or um, someone you're supporting or working with, counseling? Why is it difficult? I will uh, I'll read some of the responses. I know Beth put this question in early on. Uh, oh, we, did okay. have one re we did have one response. Um, the fact that they cannot give feedback, so we don't know how much they understand or how to better support them in this area was one response. Mm -hmm. um, somebody else said people's own discomfort or lack of confidence. And everyone else is still typing. Okay. <laughs> Sexuality was not openly discussed in my family. That's actually a great one for me to move on with because I'm going to bring that up as yeah, well. But, absolutely. Um, yeah, so just to add to that, like what were the messages that you all received growing up about sexuality um, yourself? So you could put that in the chat as well because that's definitely one of the barriers is it's kind of this taboo topic. So it feels almost like you're not supposed to talk about it. Um, so what did what kind of messages did you all get? Yeah, some uh, someone said right before you typed that. Actually, it's considered taboo to discuss these things for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, one person said you were going to get pregnant. Some people are saying it was not discussed with them during childhood. Uh, women don't like sex. If you do, you're a slut. Mm -hmm. um, wasn't discussed. Raised in a very religious home, and it was deemed inappropriate. The only reason to have sex is to have children. Yeah. Sex for marriage. Uh huh. Yeah, which, you know, that one comes up a lot. Like, don't, well, don't talk about it is usually one of the top ones. And then also wait until you're married. And, um, you know, that's definitely focused on sex. Um, but 
that that message came from a long time ago when people got married much younger than they do now. So now it's a kind of a big ask, you know, because people don't get married till late twenties or something. And um, so I think it's more difficult than when you have teenagers. You can certainly say that, but it's a long time before people end up getting married. So um, it's just interesting that that one's still around as well. Um, and the other ones that come up a lot are, well, I guess just in general, um, on, Michelle, on the list, were there any positive messages that people received about sexuality? Uh, <laughs> I don't see any positive messages. Scrolling, scrolling. Yeah. Uh, there is uh, one person was given a set of books by their parents. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So what, what I've noticed over the last 20, 25 years is there were never any positive messages, you know, all negative, maybe once in a while, one person would say, oh, my mom was great and told me everything. And, you know, uh, but rarely. And now I see more of it. Um, so maybe five out of 40 people or three versus none, you know, so it's kind of moving in that direction. But I think that's one thing that you all can do is to give positive messages, whether it's to your children or um, that, that this is a positive part of people's lives um, and to not be so fearful, but easier said than done, of course. Um, so just a few other barriers like self-advocates uh, feel like they've been shamed or controlled and are afraid to ask questions and get information. So that's a personal barrier. And, you know, many may not believe they have the right and no one will talk to them because they're not sure how to do it and are scared to talk about it. Um, they worry that it might give them ideas and believe that if we talk about it, they'll do it, which is not true. And research shows that talking about it, people get more information and uh, are less likely to engage in sexual behavior. And if they do, use protection. So we know that sexuality education has positive results, comprehensive, medically accurate sexuality education. And others worry it will only cause pain and they will be taken advantage of. And sometimes agencies are afraid to teach it or because parents might be upset um, and may, maybe don't buy into the, this idea that knowledge is power. Um, ignorance is not bliss. So just a couple things around sexual self-advocacy. So if self-advocacy means taking the initiative to speak up in your everyday life to improve your situation, change the story, or help someone else, what does sexual self-advocacy mean to you? So you can throw those things in the chat too. Like if you think about what does that mean exactly to be a sexual self-advocate or a strong sexual self-advocate? They're typing. <laughs> uh, I can answer. Uh, my answer would um, just having information about, you know, your body and your rights and your ability to consent or not consent. Mm -hmm. I think it's an important part of self advocacy. Sure. I'll, pu I'll put the sort of a summary of the definition and I think I put this in the handouts, but I might not have, but I will. This is just a summary of the bigger definition that Green Mountain Self Advocates came up with. But really, it's two, two parts. It's speaking up for your right or your desire to be in a relationship and then within a relationship as well, like you were saying, consent. So it's speaking up for yourself sexually, uh, getting information is being a self advocate is saying, I want to learn about this. Uh, taking a stand, saying to whomever, this is my choice. Stating your sexual limits and desires with your partner, respecting others' limits and desires. Starting to do what you want with relationships. So, Michelle, I don't know if anything was added around. Yeah. yeah. So, deciding on when, where, and who you want to be intimate with. Changing your mind at any time. Mm -hmm. Great. Yes, right. So there's a lot around consent um, and I, I'll make sure that that pamphlet is in there. Um, 
But self-advocates say it's harder to be a sexual self-advocate. And I mentioned that earlier because of people's reactions to the request or talking about it. Or, um, so that makes it more difficult. So I often use this framework around sexual self-advocacy. So what, what are the beliefs that are needed to be a strong sexual self-advocate? So you were just talking about what does it mean to you? But for me, there, there's beliefs we have to have in order to be a strong sexual self-advocate. And what, what does a strong se sexual self-advocate know? What knowledge do they have? And then what skills do they have? And so I often use that framework, like starting with beliefs. Um, and what I'll show you is, here's just some examples of beliefs, but it's my body, mind, and life, and I get to decide what's right for me. And I think the reason that's so important is if we talk about something like consent or healthy relationships, information isn't enough. You have to believe that you have bodily autonomy and that you get to decide. And many people with disabilities don't get to decide often. And so anytime we can provide choices, that's going to help them realize that they're in charge <laughs> of their lives. Um, I do a, in the curriculum, I do an activity from a Planned Parenthood in California where we do this name tag game. So people put their name tag either on this side or this side so we can learn their name. And, and then I say, that's right, it's your body. You get to decide what's right for you. And then the next time they're in class, I tell, ask for a volunteer and you know put your name tag where you want it. And then I say, you know, I'm the teacher. I think you need to move it. And they always move it. Even though I've told them it's they get to decide where the name tag goes, it's their body. But an authority figure, they feel like they have to do what they're told. So really having that belief that no, you can't tell me what to do with my um, name tag is is a great, it's a lot of it comes from that belief that they're in charge. Um, so those are just some examples. It's okay to ask questions about sexuality and relationships. Learning about sexuality helps me make healthy decisions in my life. Everyone is a sexual being, including me. Lots of other things. Uh, even if you've had negative experiences, even if I've had negative experiences, I can still be healthy as well, rather than, oh, I shouldn't talk about this, or um, I should always listen to my teacher. Those are the beliefs that wouldn't make a strong sexual self-advocate. So I often have self-advocates think about what are their, what are the important beliefs to have to be a strong sexual self-advocate. And I have them look over the list we create and think about which ones do you have? Which ones do you struggle to believe? And they're really open about, you know, I, I feel this way, but I don't, that other one I don't really believe yet because I always get the message that I'm not supposed to talk about it. So looking at beliefs and then knowledge is power. So that what does a strong sexual self-advocate need to know? And here are just some examples um, of, uh, you know, types of relationships, healthy, unhealthy, lots of different topics. What is consent? And here are some great resources. And it looks like the link isn't there for the NCIL. But um, for reading, there are some resources, um, researchautism.org. And I think I'll just, well, we have, I think we have enough time for me to just do a quick so it's this whole website for self-advocates and it's fairly text heavy. So if we go to um, healthy relationships, you know, it's a lot of reading. So the nice thing is they have a podcast too of all of the, um, all the different episodes. So you can listen to a podcast if someone's not a really strong reader or they like listening more than reading. Um, so that's something to see. And then um, our website, Elevatus, if you go to resources, there's lots of articles and free downloads and different websites that we recommend. And these, these articles are many different topics, but also um, some lessons you could use too with people. And these are all free to download. I put a couple of articles in the, in the um, folder, handout folder. 
And then this is also a sex talk for self advocates. And I was one of the presenters and we did lots and lots of different topics. And you could listen to a webinar with someone and talk about it. And there's a guide for how you could use the webinars as well. But actually, and also towards the end, the last ones, we had a lot of self advocates come on and be part of the presentation. And this last one is um, sexual self advocacy. So great content and people with disabilities voices. And I already showed the podcast. And then the last one is that you can Google NCIL sex ed for people with IDD and you'll see the list of videos. So that's just, you know, so if you're thinking about knowledge, what's the knowledge that people need to learn, even sometimes for yourselves to look at these websites to see what are all the topics that are talked about too. So that's another resource for getting, teaching more knowledge. All right. And skills, lots and lots of practice speaking up, really. You know, it, the more we practice, the better we get at it. Um, how do you advocate for your rights to be in a, any relationship that you choose? How do you speak up in your relationships? How do you speak up to staff or your parents about what you want and, and your relationships? And these are just some tips on speaking up to staff and parents, but I want to move on to some just some tips for parents and tips for staff or professionals. Um, so this is just some ideas around um, speaking up and also this whole piece about becoming a peer educator too. We're trying to train more and more self advocate professional teams to lead sexuality education classes. There's a project in Michigan that has, and these are lower numbers, they have many teams of self-advocate professionals teaching classes all over the state of Michigan. All right, so parents. Um, I think one thing that's important is that sexuality education is sexual abuse prevention. So the name tag, even though we're not talking about sexual abuse, it's about bodily autonomy and when, you know, you get to decide. Um, and that knowledge is power. And I did put an article in the, in the folder as well on knowledge is power, power, sorry. It's also important for you to talk about sexuality because as parents, we give our values too. And so that's an opportunity to talk about what you think is okay or not okay and why as well. So you talking to your own children or family member, you're sharing values, which are important. There's a lot of sexuality education. We don't, I don't teach my values or anything. I, I teach common values like about respect and kindness, um, but around sexual things, um, I'm values neutral. Uh, and so it's great for parents to talk about it. It doesn't give your children ideas, but knowledge and skills to make informed choices. And if we don't teach healthy sexuality, someone else might teach unhealthy sexuality. The media, um, a person, you know. So I know it's difficult, but you could also have a backup person too. You know, maybe it's somebody that's supporting your child, um, either they're young or grown, and someone else that um, can talk be the person to talk to your child so they're not just getting um, media messages and and the other thing is um, restrictions and control do not work and self-advocates say that the, they actually make them more risky so they if someone tries to restrict and this is either parents or professionals then they go around them and so they do things they're not supposed to do um, and then what if something bad happens? They don't feel like they can come back to anyone to talk about it, to figure it out because they were somewhere they weren't supposed to be. Um, so I think, you know, when we think about controlling and restricting, because we're scared, I get it. We're really scared. Um, it can backfire and self-advocates say they're way more risky. Um, when people control or, or um, restrict them. And there's an article that um, is in the folder 
as well about this study where they talked to different self-advocates about what they wanted and what was happening. Um, and just some things to consider as a parent, you know, notice how you feel when you're thinking about discussing this topic. You know, are you anxious, happy, stressed, scared, joyful? Um, and we want to try to, if we feel any kind of negative feelings, it may come across. Um, and we might give this message that we won't talk about it and we want them to talk to us um, rather than a friend maybe or not know anything at all. So um, we want to try to be open and non-judgmental and, and hear what, what um, our, the people in our lives are looking for. And there's also some resources for parents in the handouts as well. It's actually parents and professionals. And focus, you know, not only sexual abuse prevention, you know, there's other parts of sexuality than just preventing abuse, but it is part of it. Um, they need relationship and communication skills, and we need to come at it from a, a positive, not negative place or fear based. So if you saw the movie Mean Girls, the gym teacher is teaching about sexuality and sexual relationships. And he says, if you have sex, you will get chlamydia and you will die. Right. So these like fear. Um, and again, the control and restrict. And then for professionals, all those things, except sort of the values piece, focus on being positive. Uh, keep your values to yourself because it's not our job as professionals to share values. Um, teach facts and help uh, help them make their own decisions, sort of like supported decision making. Um, so what would be good about that choice? What would be negative about that choice and exploring choices? And I already showed you the resources. So lots of good stuff for both parents and professionals. And then I think one thing for everyone is, you know, the positives of providing sexuality education is self-advocates feel empowered and make decisions about what they want in their lives. It reduces sexual abuse, charges of sex crimes, loneliness, sexual behaviors at work, unplanned pregnancy, and sexually transmitted infections, and increases connection and healthy relationships, and you're making a difference in the lives of people with IDD. And the con, there really are no cons, but the cons are us. We're, you know, they, they hit us, right? Like we might feel uncomfortable if someone mentioned why it's difficult, um, or people could get upset with us. But when we're really thinking about the individual, there's so many benefits to them and so few negative for us. It's, it, to me, it's kind of a no brainer, but I am in the field. So, um, but just sort of comparing those two, I think is important. If we're really focusing on supporting someone else, um, it might be uncomfortable, but people say it's a lot easier than they thought it was going to be. And it gets easier and easier and easier the more they talk about it. So just a couple things here. This is um, the self, uh, the, 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 a committee that put together some sexual rights. Um, and I wanted to show you what they are and then show you a video. And then I don't, I will, we'll open it up for a few questions, I guess. But here are some different rights that self-advocates created. So I have the right to say what happens to and with my body. I have the right to privacy and showing and sharing my sexuality. So lots of different ones. Um, and on our website and the resources, we did a different sexual right every month. So some ways that you can support either as a family member or a professional supporting someone, uh, ways you can do it to, to help them make sure their, their rights are being honored. But there's lots of different rights here to take a look at. And so we created these 10 rights. So there's an article on each one and um, how you can teach about it. But this last video, uh, I don't know if you've seen it, um, but the uh, just the two of us, it was for um, World Down Syndrome Day. And it's just a great video um, about those around people with disabilities. And it's really touches on the right to privacy as well. So let me get that going and then uh, we can go through some questions. Oops. Yeah. 
just the two of us. We can make it if we try. Just the two of us. You and I. I see the crystal raindrops fall. And the beauty of it all. And when the sun comes shining through. Just the two of us. the two of us, you my favorite video right now. Um, I think I saw one, a chat that said spot on or something like that. Yeah. And I got a heart over there from Mickey. Um, yeah. So yes, well-meaning, supportive people, but really in the sauna, you know, uh, in the bedroom, right? So it's, it's, I just love the, the message it sends around people deserve privacy. Um, all right. So how about some questions? And then I can talk about um, anything, any questions you have. Um, I was going to say you can type your questions in the chat if you have any, or you can unmute and ask or raise your hand. We'll unmute you. While they're thinking about their questions, I will say, uh, <laughs> I love this topic. Uh, obviously, I, <laughs> I was like, we need to have her here. Um, so important, uh, you know, that we, one of the things that we do in a, in a program that, that we operate for mental health here um, is teach about different aspects of well-being and relationships is one of those. Um, and I like how you touch on all the different types of relationships and romantic relationships. And we certainly see a lot of situations where uh, avoidance uh, to protect is is the case. Um, so I just really appreciated, you know, the resources that you shared and the self advocacy piece, um, right. and the especially the the sex education that was for and by people with IDD. I thought that was. Uh, really remarkable as a resource. So I just appreciate you coming on. We do have a couple of comments at least. Um, Great. Uh, well, I don't know if there's a question. Somebody said something about meeting people on the internet. <laughs> um, wonderful presentation. One question, how do we negotiate conservator insistence on um, cis conformity or abstinence, et cetera? Yeah. So in, in this state, it's guardianship, but I, I know what you're talking about. I think it depends on, I know it depends on the state. Um, and I don't, I haven't, I'm not really familiar with Tennessee. Um, is that most of, is that where most people are from? Yeah, yeah. So every, I, I'm assuming most people on here are from Tennessee. We do have some people out of state that join us. Um, but yeah, I would say yeah. the majority is from Tennessee. So I think first thing is, um, seeing a copy of the of the guardianship conservatorship to see what they are respond what they are entitled to make decisions about um, because sometimes guardians don't realize their role and they and, and if they're a parent too they could be just acting like a parent right where we worry about our kids and we want to protect them and um, so making sure they are the guardian conservatorship. Um, what are they entitled to make decisions about? And um, I think also, you know, one of the workshops I do is working working with parents and partnering with parents. So how do you talk to parents in a way that they feel respected and um, will partner with you? And yeah, so I think that's an important piece if it's the parent, um, the guardian. Um, and build the relationship so that you can talk about tough things um, as well. But yeah, so I'm not sure if that helped much, but I would look at the laws around um, 
guardianship and consent and age of consent and what they can consent to and things like that. Um, Cause not every, just because someone has an intellectual developmental disability doesn't mean they can't consent. That tends to be where people, the default is that they can't and they have to prove to me that they can. But um, that's kind of, I'm always saying assume people can unless otherwise demonstrated. Um, so give that them the, the respect that they can. And then if you're concerned about something and not the choices they're making around who their partner is, you know, that you might disagree with. But if you're concerned that they don't really understand what they're consenting to or that they have a choice, um, things like that, then we want to find out what they need to learn about. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. I think um, building a relationship with, you know, that that person who who may be struggling with, you know, just being accepting of of that part of of that person or or their um, son or daughter or, or child. Um, I think that that piece is really huge. I think understanding, you know, what happens if if we don't do this if we don't educate or we don't um let them you know reach their full potential <laughs> and and be happy and and have things that make them happy uh, i think that piece is really important um the understanding behind it is really important so i definitely agree uh with with your <laughs> suggestion um i do want to say though um, just because I have an opportunity to plug it, uh, <laughs> the DD Council and several other um, LGBTQ plus uh, providers in Tennessee, uh, advocates in Tennessee have created a section of Pathfinder now that is specifically for LGBTQ plus um, resources, whether it's mental health, whether it's affirming providers. Um, whether it's peer supports. So I'm going to put the link to that in the chat box because I think it's important to share information like that. And those are specific uh, to Tennessee, but just a really cool resource um, to share because uh, I know there's not uh, always a lot out there uh, in that regard specific to our population and this this resource is. So I put that in the chat just for, for people to have also. Right. And this is just all the handouts. And I realize that there, the sexual self-advocacy one is not in here, so I'll put it in here, but lots of other resources as well. Absolutely. Listed. So thank you. thank you so much, Catherine, for being here. Well, uh, for all um, of the resources. I hope people, you know, really dig in and look at the resources and utilize them and uh, really love the pieces about teaching advocacy and and all of the things that that you incorporated into your presentation. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time to come and do this. Um, and that is that is a wrap uh, for That's this wrap. Of the clinical consultation network. Uh, we'll see you all next Tuesday at noon um, and hope you enjoy the rest of your week. 1230. 12:30. See, I'm just all over. It's been too long, Bab, since I've hosted this. 12:30. <laughs> all right, y'all. Have a great day. Thank you.